Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the NETEC COVID-19 webinar series uh, titled Innovative Engineering Controls to Contain COVID. So I'm really excited about our panel presenters today and the information that we're going to share with you. I've also always, uh, I've worked in healthcare a long time, and one of the things that I have been um, profoundly um, excited about and wowed about uh, so far in this outbreak is just the ability of our facilities uh, leaders and architects and engineers to really creatively help us place engineering controls in place uh, to really safeguard our healthcare workers. So uh, my name is Shelley Sweethelm and I'm a nurse leader here at Nebraska Medicine, but I also have a role in education and training uh, for the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center otherwise known as NETEC. Next slide. So a little bit about our uh, agenda today. Uh, we're going to just briefly touch on the hierarchy of controls and where the engineering controls uh, fits into that um, hierarchy. Discuss a little bit about the spaces that are going to be needed to provide care for the continuum um, in the uh, ability to really match that up with uh, the care needs of the individuals with COVID. We're going to hear from a colleague out of New York, Bellevue Hospital, who's going to tell us a little bit about how they're managing on the front line right now and some of the creative things they've done in their facilities and engineering, as well as hear some of the processes here at Nebraska Medicine to convert uh, spaces into large ICUs and a lot of other creative uh, thoughts as well from them. And then finally, kind of finish up with sort of uh, best tips and tell you a little bit more about some of the NETEC resources and uh, other webinars to come. We'll finish up with questions and answers today. So I want to just encourage you to use the questions and answers tab. We don't want to use the chat tab, but instead would like to really use the question and answers tab. If you see a question that somebody poses that's really uh, something you like, um, just like it, you know, thumbs up, like it, and that'll move it up in the queue as far as our prioritization of questions we'll address at the end of the webinar today. We also want to let you know that we will be uh, providing uh, the audio and slide deck, uh, and we'll place that out on our website, netech.org, very quickly after the session so that that can be shared uh, broadly with anybody who wasn't able to make it today. So with that, uh, next slide. So I want to tell you a little bit about the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center. Our mission is to increase the capability of the United States public health and healthcare systems to safely and effectively manage individuals with suspected and confirmed special pathogens. So you can easily find us at netech.org, and you can also email us for any questions you have to info at netech.org. So a high-level overview of what NETEC provides, uh, we have sort of four pillars of uh, work products that we uh, support. One is assessment. So uh, prior to the COVID outbreak, uh, we did a lot of work with uh, heading out to different uh, healthcare facilities across the U.S. Um, people would do a self-assessment in advance, and those tools are definitely out on our website. Uh, to grab at any time and do that self-assessment, but we would really approach it a, a site visit in a non-punitive, non-regulatory way and be able to do technical assistance on site with the team and provide some um, really, I think, nice support to, uh, number one, a lot of places we're doing things really great and we always learn best practices from them, but also the opportunities then to give them some kind of really strong guidance in a direction or another to really enhance their overall preparedness. In education, we had a suite of online uh, trainings. Uh, so we have uh, continuing education and online trainings that are out there uh, for anybody to grab and, and do at any time. And several of those are very much focused on identify, isolate, and inform, which is certainly applicable to uh, COVID response. Uh, we've got some just-in-time training videos that can be easily used. And then prior to COVID, we were doing a lot of work uh, with in-person courses across the U.S. And um, since that time, since we're not able to really do much of that with travel right now, we're doing these enhanced webinar series to really provide as much real-time, just-in-time information that we can on varied topics. 
Technical assistance is another opportunity. So uh, again, uh, info at netech.org. If you just go to the website, you can plug in your, your question and we'll triage that to a subject matter expert um, as appropriate. We have a robust online repository of tools and resources. We have a COVID page that you can uh, grab lots of different things, download them, use them as you wish uh, to help with your response. And then finally, we have a research network infrastructure. So we've been able to do um, some uh, uh, work with really looking at what are the therapeutics currently for COVID ID and uh, create policies and procedures around how to really uh, look at those from a standpoint of um, therapeutics in this outbreak. Next slide. So before I kick it off to our speakers today, I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes on the hierarchy of controls. So this is a, a well-known uh, resource and visual that most everybody probably is well aware of. So when we think about the most effective and least effective uh, infection prevention and control practices, we think about elimination and substitution as being ones that are really kind of hard to implement in um, healthcare settings. So an elimination example might be vaccination. As we all know, we're struggling with that in this COVID outbreak and probably won't see a vaccine for um, up to a year and maybe even longer than that. So that one's not really uh, much of an option right now for us. Substitution is really replacing the hazard. So um, an example of that uh, would be, you know, we were in a situation in healthcare where there were a lot of needle sticks. And of course, then to substitute that hazard, we've really put in place a needleless system. So that's an example of um, how to substitute and replace a hazard. So elimination and substitution, as I mentioned, are, are you know, more difficult, I think, and typically sometimes not options for healthcare settings. However, um, when we look at how to really reduce um, exposures or avo avoid exposures, we look more to the engineering and administrative controls and then PPE. So if we can promptly detect and you know, put triage and isolation of potentially infectious patients in place, we can uh, prevent unnecessary exposures to patients and other healthcare uh, personnel as well. So when we speak about engineering controls, which is really what we're gonna focus on today in this webinar, uh, you might think of things such as airborne isolation rooms or physical barriers or ventilation systems. So that's really what we're gonna talk about today. Administrative controls are things that we're all putting into place such as, um, for example, reducing visitors or eliminating visitors in our healthcare facilities, using algorithms, protocols, checklists, um, putting training in place. So these are really used to change the way people do their work. And then finally is personal protective equipment. You know, we all sort of think of PPE as the be all end all. Well, it is very important to the overall um, response, but we also need to be mindful that a lot of these other components can be uh, very effective in helping to mitigate, as um, I mentioned, both the engineering controls and the administrative controls that we actually have ability to do something with. And then with PPE, we just need to be mindful of PPE sometimes may not be available or PPE can fail. So that's why it's sort of put at one of the, the lower um, levels of effectiveness there on the hierarchy of controls. Next slide. So I'd like to then turn it over to one of our speakers today. Uh, Heather Cook is the Manager of Facilities and Project Planning here at Nebraska Medicine. So Heather, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Shelley. Um, so as Shelley said, this is Heather Cook and I've been leading uh, the implementation effort of engineering controls for these um, COVID spaces that we're gonna be talking about today. So um, we've identified two types of spaces in need of engineering controls. And in this case, engineering controls is converting the spaces over to negative airflow. Um, and as Shelley mentioned earlier, the intent is to improve isolation of people from the hazard. So the two types of spaces are large spaces and individual rooms. In the case of large spaces, it's um, on average an entire building floor that we are converting over. And uh, these floors consist of private and semi-private patient rooms. They're occupied by COVID patients in various stages of care from 
from testing to quarantine all the way um, to the morgue. And so um, the other type of space is individual rooms. And these are rooms or suites that the staff is, um, is performing procedures on COVID potential or positive patients. Also, um, these areas consist of clinic spaces where we have potential COVID or positive patients as well as people that um, that is not a concern. And so we've been working to convert these individual rooms over to negative airflow versus the entire building floor as we discussed before. So um, in a little bit, Eric Sherman is going to talk about how we've done this and get into more details there. So I will hand it over to Michael. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, live from New York City, it's uh, Wednesday afternoon, and I'm here to just uh, give you an update of what's been happening at Bellevue and some of the facilities and engineering responses that we've done uh, to try to um, slow down uh, and protect our staff. Next slide. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about Bellevue and the hospital, including the basic building features. I want to really stress patient flow and then talk about what we've done using portable HEPA units uh, to create negative pressure rooms for uh, ICUs, surge capacity uh, for COVID and PUI patients on nursing units, and uh, even a project that we've done looking at turning uh, some of our operating rooms into negative pressure uh, medicine ICU beds. Next slide. So uh, first of all, Bellevue is uh, uh, on the east side of Manhattan along the uh, East River. It was designed during the 1960s and opened in 1973. It's a 24-story cube. The building is as wide as uh, high, um, and bottom line is it's about 1.4 million uh, gross square feet. Each floor is actually an acre. Um, since the building was designed in the 60s, it was designed as 100% fresh outside with 100% of the air being exhausted. Uh, no, e even when we've been, done renovations, uh, we have not um, participated in any recirculated air. Next slide. So um, this is a picture on the 10th floor of our uh, ICUs. There used to uh, be 54 ICU beds that were all shared between uh, the surgical ICU, CCU, medicine and neuro and essentially um, we we canceled all elective surgeries and in order to expand our medicine ICU beds from 12 beds to 54 we actually relocated the SICU CCU and NICU patients up to our PACU outside of our OR suite next slide so under normal circumstances, so out of those 54 um, uh, ICU beds, you know, we had one in each corner uh, that was negatively pressurized as, as, an, um, as an ICU uh, negative pressure bed. Um, but essentially uh, what we've decided to do um, in order to protect our healthcare workers are, uh, we removed one of the window panels in each of the rooms and we ducted a portable HEPA unit uh, directly outside uh, and working with our HVAC and balancing and controls folks, we've been able to convert uh, the remaining 50, uh, 48 patient rooms that were, um, that were positively pressured into negative pressure isolation rooms. And you can see on the, uh, on the back of the picture there, uh, you know, we removed the window, we put a filler uh, played in. You can see the ductwork going down to a uh, blue portable HEPA filter that we were able to um, get very quickly. And uh, as a result, um, we've been able to uh, duct uh, all of that, uh, all, all of uh, the, the room air uh, out of the window uh, uh, through the uh, HEPA unit. This also allowed uh, our providers um, to relocate some of the critical equipment, like for instance, IV pumps outside of the room um, and, and uh, be able to uh, be in the unit without having to wear personal protective equipment 
on the outside, uh, they obviously gown uh, in PPE when they go inside the room to care for patients, but all of the rooms are tied into a central critical care uh, monitoring system, and uh, the nurses are able to go from uh, room to room outside of the room without wearing PPE in order to adjust medications and do medication management. Next slide. One of the other things that we expanded upon was our endoscopy suite. So our endoscopy suite consisted of uh, uh, 10 um, recovery positions and uh, five um, exam were being done. We uh, canceled our, uh, all of our endos. Any emergency endoscopy now ha has to be done in the OR. And we converted that entire recovery space um, to an additional 12 medicine ICU beds by using a large portable um, construction HEPA filter. Um, you can see uh, at the very end of the picture where there's a plastic um, wall that's been put up with a zipper wall, and you can actually see um, the large construction uh, HEPA unit. These are the type that you normally use uh, when you're doing abatement on construction pro uh, uh, projects of uh, asbestos-containing materials. Next slide. So um, we also got very creative as well, too. So not only were we able to expand ICU beds, uh, but we also were able to expand um, uh, a large number of medicine and surgery beds uh, for the uh, COVID-19 surge, uh, including um, both patients who had tested positive, as well as patients that were still under investigation. So seeing as the, bel uh, the building was uh, old, uh, we had, um, we had uh, taken over a lot of unused uh, med surge spaces, uh, and we're using them for different programs like occupational health services. We have a World Trade Center clinic here. We also had some, some uh, patient, old patient rooms that were being used by our surgery admin folks. Um, and what we were able to do is very quickly uh, move all of those folks out of those areas and um, get them all ready again for an inpatient surge. Uh, each one of these uh, rooms that were being used as offices were old patient rooms, either semi-private or, or four-bedded rooms. And we also were able to using, you could see behind the bed, uh, we removed a window panel like we did in the ICU, and we were able to duct out a portable HEPA unit that we were able to purchase. Um, and by balancing the room, we were able to make it negative pressure as well, too, so that um, our staff could work freely among uh, out in the nurses' station in the corridors and would only have to don and doff PPE when going into a patient room. Uh, we've also have brought in uh, some wireless monitors uh, where we're able to read um, uh, uh, SPO2 monitors uh, wirelessly from a central station uh, so that, again, uh, prevents uh, staffing, uh, nurse staffing and support staffing from going to the patient rooms. Um, and this has been a huge help in um, being able to not only support um, the, um, the good work that's being done, um, but by keeping our, our patients safe as well, too. Next slide. Last project that we did um, was uh, actually taking a look at how we could convert one of our operating rooms into an ICU. Um, and so, this is uh, one of our ORs where we've removed all of the OR equipment, the table, the anesthesia machines, uh, you know, practically everything out of the unit. Uh, we were able to bring in uh, stretcher beds. Uh, we were able to um, provide some uh, curtain partitions uh, to separate patients. Uh, we actually were able to, to lay them out so uh, there were six feet between every, every patient. Um, we brought in emergency power uh, for each one of those beds. You can see uh, power hanging from uh, the ceiling, the OR booms, um, to support each one of uh, those patients. 
We also added uh, portable uh, critical care monitoring for each bed. You can see that those are laid out uh, on the tables in front of the ORs. Um, and then what we were able to do is using, again, one of those construction type portable HEPI units, we were able to roll one and connect it to the building's existing um, uh, exhaust system for the ORs and take uh, air from the OR, which is normally positive uh, to protect patients and reduce surgical wound infections, uh, and turn it into a negative pressure ICU um, with uh, each bed being monitored. And, you know, you could staff uh, either, you know, a one, uh, uh, one nurse for both patients and have two staff members in the OR uh, in personal protective equipment caring for those patients. Or if staffing levels really got bad, uh, you could go up to a one to four nursing ratio on that. Um, this is something that we would only use as a last resort, but um, the, the, uh, the important thing that I kind of skipped over is really the basics around patient flow. So you've probably been seeing on the nightly news just how overwhelmed emergency departments have been with patients uh, who have or uh, either the worried well or patients who have contacted, uh, contacted uh, COVID-19. Uh, and uh, from the very beginning, it was, uh, you know, Bellevue's mindset to make sure that as patients presented to the emergency department, once a decision was made that we were going to admit and test that patient, that we pulled them out of the, the, uh, the ED and get them up to either uh, a um, single patient room uh, until they were actually, uh, test results came in, if they were positive, then we would start cohorting uh, positive COVID-19 patients. Um, and, and if they were negative, we would cohort negative patients together as well too. So for the first uh, two, two or three days of the length of stay, while it was taking the turnaround time from the labs, we wanted to continue to pull patients out of the ED so that it didn't become a war zone down there. Um, six, we have been able to successfully keep up and uh, keep ahead of the patients coming. Uh, right now, I have to tell you, our emergency department is not very busy, but we, were, we are taking uh, a, at least 40 uh, medicine uh, uh, transfers every day from Elmhurst Hospital, Queens Hospital, Woodhull, Lincoln Hospital. Uh, those are located in the Bronx and Queens and Brooklyn. And we've also been taking a number of their sickest patients as well, too, up to 10 uh, ICU transfers every day. So um, many patients are getting better. Um, things are, looks like uh, we're starting to flatten out. Um, but the bottom line is, is our, uh, our facilities team has been trying to keep ahead so that we, uh, our emergency department doesn't get jammed up. Next slide. So I'd like to just pass it back to Nebraska uh, and introduce uh, Eric Sherman. Eric? Thank you, Michael. Uh, again, my name is Eric Sherman. I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm an ASHRAE healthcare facility design professional and a principal of specialized engineering solutions. I've been fortunate enough to be um, contracted to help Nebraska Medicine with conversions. I've worked on campus here for um, probably 15 years or so. So um, this, is, this has been a, an exciting experience that it's been great to be a part of. Next slide. As, as we talk about pressure throughout the building, I want to make sure that we focus on the delineation that we're not creating what would be a code required airborne infectious isolation room. There are a lot of elements of that that um, quite honestly with the speed with which we have to do the conversions and with all the guidance coming out um, from the CDC and from our partners at ASHRAE and everything else that, um, that going in and invasively creating uh, just a ton of airborne infection isolation rooms was not really feasible for, to, to support this. So as we talk about uh, the, the, the transition of pressure and cascading pressure and cascading airflow throughout the facility, um, keep in mind that, that the rooms themselves were not turning into airborne infectious isolation rooms by the letter of law of the code. We are getting them as close as we can and hitting as many of the boxes as we can in doing that. So 
as we looked at where we were going to um, put these patients, it, the, the first thing we really looked at was not the infrastructure of the mechanical systems and how they could support cascading uh, pressure and cascading negative airflow. What we looked at was the medical gas and power infrastructure up through the facility and what, what could support um, what we anticipated to be uh, the no, a number of ventilators that, that the facility had never seen in simultaneous use. So um, the, the very first elements were to go through and identify from, from an acuity standpoint, from a patient room standpoint, um, where we could put these patients safely and, and we could check that kind of worry off the list. Um, that, that resulted in, in activating some cross connects, bringing some new infrastructure in line, validating things throughout the facility. While we were doing that, we were moving on um, the units with Nebraska Medicine's clinical team uh, because they were trying to keep the, uh, the patient populations consolidated into areas of the facility so there wasn't a lot of cross traffic, meaning they weren't picking a unit all the way to the north and a, a unit all the way to the west. We were trying to consolidate floors into towers, um, and we were looking real time at what it took to do that. Things we were looking at were how redundant are the systems supporting those towers, uh, how many floors was a single system touching, how new were the systems, and what level of control that we had uh, in that. So we, from that, we kind of zeroed in on the, the floors that we wanted to, to go to, um, which were in line with the original pandemic plan that, that has been in place for quite a while. But the next, the next step after that is we, we had to adapt it to this specific pandemic and, and look at um, what we needed from a failure scenario. If we lost a fan, what was the result? result if we lost um, a motor or a bearing or, or anything like that what was the result and, and we kept digging down into the failure failure scenarios of each of the conversions we were doing we had to bring in uh, to do that we, we had to bring in a, a, a pretty comprehensive group it was facilities and controls we had engineering uh, we had nursing and infection control and talk, talk them through um, so, so they understood the expectations of what we were doing and could align and, and get ready to occupy the conversions after we did it one of the first things we found was that uh, plans weren't, uh, weren't terribly helpful, that, that a really detailed checklist, um, along with some supplemental guidance, was the fastest way uh, to, to accomplish the conversion. Here um, at Nebraska Medicine, we were very, very fortunate. Uh, we have a, a, a really solid in-house controls team, and um, they were uh, completely critical at every step to, to being able to stay in front of things and um, if anybody that's worked in buildings a lot knows if you try to move large blocks of a building pressure between two or three independent buildings connected to it, it creates quite a bit of um, uh, issue. So we were able to use that controls team and their knowledge of the building to stay ahead of everything. We can go to the next slide. So like I said, we, we started by reviewing the, the, the pandemic surge plan, which, which was already in place. From there, we looked at um, the zoning of, of uh, patients by type. And then um, the, the first selected space was uh, a, a vacated area that was um, previously used for protective environment for um, immunocompromised patients. This was a great first step. It gave us, I think, 24 beds, um, but it, it checked a, a, a ton of the boxes for us. It had uh, independent pressure controls. They were all automated on all of the, um, on all of the patient rooms. It was acuity flexible. It could support ICU patients down through just a standard med surge. Um, the rooms themselves were originally designed to hold pressure. So then turning them around, um, allowing us to, to, to reverse pressure was much easier. The systems that supported it, supported it were originally built with uh, a significant level of redundancy. Um, dealing with this in Nebraska and, and unlike Michael's facility, you know, having very little to almost no uh, units that are 100% outside air, we were having to convert all of these to 100% outside air when we did it. This unit, uh, ha having newer, uh, newer equipment parts and pieces, we were able to uh, convert that to 100% to outside air, and that's going to be able to hold till well into the summer. Um, we're not as fortunate as we get to some of the other areas of the facility, but, um, but th that this unit worked out well from, from that standpoint. And then compartmentalization of the unit, um, the, the access in and out and, and safety uh, to, to this unit was, um, was another box that it, that it checked. So we went in and we um, deployed cascading airflow. Um, it's important to note, and as we go through the next slide, is that this all works as a system. So 
you extract the air in the patient rooms, you keep some pressure differential between the core and the patient room, um, and, then you, and then you keep the unit itself negative with respect to the rest of the house. But, but in doing that, you do have to blow up the, the nursing core a little, little bit. But by, by doing that, you do a couple things. You give uh, the staff and healthcare providers uh, a safe space in the middle uh, that gets 100% outside air that's filtered, um, and even we've even been able to do the staff lounges and a few other uh, spaces, 100%, uh, nothing, nothing comes out of there, so they're guaranteed they can't reverse um, fresh air in there. Um, and then Heather can talk a little bit to the impacts of PPE with that, but that was the concept for, um, you know, the, I think we're up to around 150 beds converted now through all of the beds that we converted. Next slide. So yep, as we go through the animations on the slide, so this is the seventh floor of the first unit we converted. And as you see on the left, this was a positive pressure room. Originally, um, we were protecting the patients uh, and, and then re reverting it. As you can see, the red arrows, we're, we're bringing everything into the unit from the rest of the house. We're going through the um, uh, patient rooms and out. And then we're, we're um, blowing up the core with, with uh, clean and, and, and fresh air. The pressures ended up in this unit greater than, uh, or I guess it'd be less than, but uh, negative 0 0.01 from the house to the unit. And each individual room we were able to get at, um, at, at greater than that negative 0 0.01 pressure differential, um, which in, in this unit was, um, that, that was, that was a, a really good thing, a peace of mind for the staff. Another thing specific to this unit is that we could get really close to the 12 air changes. Um, that would be the requirement for the airborne infectious isolation room. There were some compromises, however, when, when we talk about being short of an airborne infectious isolation room, um, the air isn't extracted over the patient like we would like. The, the exhaust, the normal exhaust, and our converted return that is now 100% exhaust is commingled with, with some of the other house exhaust. Um, we were able to get real access, real-time access to ASHRAE 170 committee and talk this through. And, and um, they weighed in and, and indicated their position on, on the limit of risk from that. Uh, that organization's been invaluable throughout, throughout the process. And then we mitigated some of the other risks by doing a lot of testing and a lot of signage. So we came in after we, we um, blocked off uh, from a facility standpoint, we sealed off. We did a lot of things with signage we'll talk about in a little bit, but making sure that um, everybody was uh, safe and secure and, and knew what they were working on. So after we left that unit, again, the first 24, we moved on to other parts of the facility and we encountered um, a significantly different story. Uh, we ran into old systems, induction systems, fan cool unit systems, pneumatics, dual duct, uh, things that you can't easily change. And so th then we started talking about speed. How can we convert these quickly? And then how do we leave the facility not in a mess when they have to go back in a few months and turn them back? So in lieu of doing a lot of invasive balancing, we went to um, what you see on the right, which is blocking off the grills of plastic and signage. And that by default, when, when we peel those off after everything is done, uh, the system goes back to, to where, where it needs to be. We did a lot of tricking of systems, a lot of decoupling of safeties. These systems were never meant to originally work the way they work. So we um, undid a lot of interfaces between the supply fans and return fans. Um, and then uh, we had uh, several units that didn't have preheat. We've been down in the 20s in temperature since then. Uh, so we had to, we had to uh, turn some air back on itself and, and do a few things to keep things online. The, the one um, significant sacrifice to, to, to talk about is that, um, as we're going to see in a few weeks here, is the thermal comfort. So we kept our air changes up, but our air changes have been replaced from a, a, from a return site. So we're not, we're not getting, if we're getting six air changes in the rooms, they're not 50 degree, 55 degree air changes. They're 72 degree, 68 degree air changes. So a lot of this went along with education for the uh, healthcare providers that, that these rooms aren't necessarily going to be comfortable in a, in, in a few weeks here. We can go to the next slide. And I'll turn it back to Heather. All right, thank you. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the PPE process in these negative, um, on the negative floors that Eric just talked about. And we reused this graph and, and just added um, the nursing core again to the end. So as, as Eric had mentioned, the, 
the core, which is essentially the nursing station and the center of the floor um, and corridors outside of the patient rooms are positive to the patient rooms and the patient rooms are, are negative. Um, and then the rest of the house per se is, is positive to the nursing core. So upon entering from, from somewhere, from a non-negative floor into this space, um, the process that we're using today is for anyone to don a procedure mask as they enter into the, the nursing core. And then um, for the staff that will, that, I'm sorry, excuse me for a second. Um, for the staff that is entering into patient rooms, they will either in the PPE clean storage space or just prior to entering into the room will doff their procedure mask and don an N95 mask, a face shield, gown, and gloves. And so they, they keep that on while they're tending to the patient. And then upon exiting immediately out of the patient room, they will doff their gown and gloves. And as you may have seen in some of our other webinars, we have an extended use uh, period or process that we have developed for wearing N95 masks and face shields to preserve PPE. So um, they'll keep that on for the extended period and then um, remove that, doff it, and, and put it in the appropriate dirty storage space. So next slide, please. Um, some spaces that were a topic of conversation as we were going through this process were offices and break rooms on the floor. And so after a lot of discussion um, with some of our experts on this, we had we discussed and have decided that as long as in the closed door office spaces, oh, one thing to mention on, on the negative floors is that all of the patient rooms need to remain closed in order to maintain that negative air pressure. Um, and also it's a, it provides that level, additional level of safety for the staff that's working in that area, which then allows us to follow this PPE process. So um, we, have, we have allowed the office staff who have offices on, on these um, negative pressure floors to remain in their offices with the door closed. Um, if they can achieve a six foot level of social distancing, the guidance has been that they do not need to wear a procedure mask, but if they can't, that a procedure mask is required. And then the break rooms and lunch spaces are also in the more positive core on all of these floors. And again, the social distancing is really the high level of guidance here that if you can, if you can achieve a six foot level of social distancing, that it's okay then to eat and drink remove your procedure mask and eat and drink in these spaces. If you can't, an alternate location would be required um, to take your lunch breaks or, or whatever you need to do. Next slide. Hand it back to Eric to start this off. So, so one of the things that, that we've, we've done continuously through the process is, is just trying to get information back to other teams trying to do the same thing. So we've kind of had this, this, ongoing hit list of items to, to keep in mind. Um, so we'll just go through kind of what some of these mean. The, one, of the, one of the most important things we can stress is that spe specifically on an engineer's, engineering control standpoint, uh, there is new information coming out every night. Europe has been good about getting their information out and the coasts have been good about, about the people that are in front about getting real-time study information out. So, it's important that you're updating as you're, as, you're, as you're involved in the weeds on these conversions during the day, some of them overnight as well, but you have a point person that's, that's getting the, the latest information, the latest updates from the people out in front um, and incorporating them. And then Heather can speak to this, but every schedule that we had was a condensed schedule. We had around 48 hours um, every time that we've had to convert a room from the time that they, uh, you know, they said go to the time that it has to be occupied. So, um, making sure that you've prepared uh, in, in detail for contingencies and have things on hand to, to anticipate a, a condensed schedule. Uh, we have been coming in real time with safety and education for the facility operators. We're converting return systems into exhaust systems. Those exhaust systems are serving COVID positive rooms. So making sure that we're sealing off uh, access doors, that we're labeling those access doors, that these are no longer just return systems. So as the next shift comes online, they understand it. And then since we aren't discharging 10 feet above the, sea, above the roof line, um, putting, putting signage and putting um, standbacks on the roof and, and telling people to, to stay. I think the Nebraska Medicine, Medical Center also um, implemented um, 
uh, PPE requirements for their maintenance personnel in contact with those systems. Um, engineering and clinical judgment, several of the things we're doing haven't been done before and there's no real code or guideline out there. So making sure that the people doing it are staying in touch with other people and they are um, you know, in line with industry best, best practices. Um, adaptability, the, the way we did our first conversion is not the way we're doing our fifth conversion. Uh, we found ways to speed it up, we found ways to do it better, and we're incorporating those each time that, that we go through, uh, go through a conversion. Access to labor and material. Um, you're touching 40-year-old motors, they're breaking. When we shut them down, they are not turning back on. So before we start the work, we're going in, we're getting motors ahead of time, we're getting belts, we're getting pulleys, we're getting relays, um, getting that all ready to go. We, we had to activate um, smoke purge fans that hadn't worked for, for more than 20 years here on campus. Um, in order to, to get a couple of the spaces going where, where we needed them to go. So, so having um, that, that access is important. And then we're real, we're real time commissioning it to, to make sure that the, the safety of the healthcare providers is, is, is being realized. So as, as they're checking the rooms out and converting them, we're going behind them and checking the boxes and monitoring the pressures and, and making sure. And then um, on a go, uh, the control department here is doing that on an ongoing um, uh, time frame. Uh, and then document and detail, because we all understand that we are going to have to turn a lot of these systems back, um, and they're, they're going to need to be turned back quickly and, and, you know, without patient outage. So making sure that we're documenting everything we've done in detail and how it has to be put back together. Uh, and then the, and the, from, from my side, the last thing I would say is just making sure that, that you have uh, talents from a facility standpoint, talents from maintenance standpoint, uh, talented balancers, talented control people. Uh, people in infection control that know what you're trying to do and understand it that are providing you feedback and, and helping guide the process. And then from a, a PPE standpoint, um, some things that we originally were planning on using one room and splitting it for clean and dirty um, spaces and we quickly realized that just with the volume of PPE that we needed as well as uh, ensuring that we didn't have, have cross-contamination and the process really flowed efficiently um, we we, we are, have transitioned to separate spaces for clean and dirty we've been using racking systems and and really command hooks just to hang all of the stuff and keep it organized um, so that it's efficient for the team working on those levels um, and and most of those PPE spaces are in the positive to the negative room core um, and then just evaluating PPE principles that we had talked about a little bit earlier when determining break room spaces and, and some other things to just think about. Sometimes we use, you know, conference rooms or spaces that aren't actually break room spaces. But if we're going to, if you're going to have the teams um, donning their masks to eat lunch um, or take a break and have a drink, uh, we you need to make sure that there's a, a sink in there or close to the space so that they have the opportunity to to appropriately wash their hands before taking off their PPE. Um, and then also the last thing that I mentioned earlier is just the, all of the patient room doors need to remain closed for this to work appropriately and provide the level of engineering controls that it's intended to do. Um, so, and Eric mentioned the maintenance PPE. We did not cover that in this, but we do have that information. If, if it's something that the team would be interested in, we can share it. That's all I have, so we can go to the next slide. Great, thanks so much. That was very interesting, great three speakers. So um, next we're gonna just uh, remind this group that uh, we're gonna continue to build resources, online education, and deliver any technical assistance that you may need. So there's some, some references for that on the screen. Next slide. So we want to get to the questions and answers, and I believe uh, lots of them have already been um, handled. So we'll just kind of walk through them so that we get them on the audio file. So the first question came from Patricia, and she said, would Bellevue be willing to share the engineering specs of the actual HEPA filter fix to negative pressure so that I could see, uh, I could see that being an important resource? And Michael already responded, he'd be happy to. Um, they were able to source a number of different types, some designed for healthcare and others for construction. Michael, anything else you would add to that? No, I mean, the bottom line is, is we, we were able to, um, 
you know, get some that we already had on site. You know, our respiratory therapy team always had a number of units that they would use to bring into rooms to do sputum induction or, uh, you know, to quickly turn a, um, you know, a, a room that's positively pressured just to recirculate air. So we started with those and, uh, and then we, we continue to use whatever we can. Uh, there are a couple of better units out there that uh, I think uh, I would uh, recommend to the group over some of the others. Um, they were just easier to duct, uh, duct out the window. Great, thank you. And the next question, um, how were you able to maintain your a ACPH while also achieving negativity? We had to dampen our supply in order to increase our exhaust, which compromised the ACPH. And I think, yeah, I think Michael, you answered this one too. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, we, you know, we just uh, worked, we, we didn't even have to work with our balancing on the supply. We were just working on trying to exhaust as more air out of the room than, um, than was coming in through the supply. Um, by using these portable HEPA filters, we were, you know, they came with a variable speed fan and we were able to increase the amount of CFMs until we just got to that point where, you know, with the magnahelic, you could see that the directional air ch airflow changed from positive to negative. Okay, great. I know this next question is a, is a big one, especially as we um, think about the diagnostics for uh, folks with COVID. I know there's a lot of interest in CT scanning. So the question was, what are the recommendations to protect staff in areas in this situation of having a, a highly positive pressure environment, which is the situation in the CT scanner room at her facility? This environment is to protect the equipment, but we're having, you know, the patient maintain a mask, but what else can we do for protection? And Michael, I think you answered that one as well. Yeah, so, you know, we haven't done this yet. However, we are looking at putting a couple of large portable HEPA filters that are made for healthcare uh, with UV lights in them to help recirculate the air that is in the, um, in, in the CT room. And, uh, you know, right now our radiologists are wearing cappers when they're going in and working with those patients. But by having the portable HEPA filters, you know, scrubbing the air 12 or 15 times, uh, you know, helps decrease the, uh, uh, the length of time between doing each cases. Thank you. And I know um, here at Nebraska, you guys also took a request from us to, to do that, create, you know, that change in CT. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, that, that would be, we have several one-off rooms that, that we've went in and, and adjusted. Um, we, we're seeing a lot of facilities do, do negative CTs. And in that case, we're, the, the, the air change is a lot of times subordinate to the heat load of those pieces of equipment. So we are um, bringing online uh, uh, additional, usually we're running the air through, um, similar to what Michael did, through a, a construction style HEPA unit and then out. But we are inverting the pressure on CT rooms. Okay, thank you. And then uh, another question from Jake says, have you turned any ORs negative for emergency procedures? So. That, that's going to continue to happen too with people who are potentially COVID positive. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, the bottom line is, is our trauma teams now, um, you know, are, are basically any patient that's coming in that needs emergency surgery right away, or even uh, any patients that we are doing life-saving uh, procedures on, they are considered those, they're treating everybody as, a, as if they are a PUI. Um, Luckily enough, uh, back in uh, five years ago, after uh, Bellevue treated successfully one of, uh, one of New York City's only uh, Ebola patient, we were able to engineer uh, one of our ORs that happens to be in labor and delivery, um, one of our emergency C-section rooms. Um, we were able to engineer with controls um, that allow that OR which is normally positively pressurized with the 20 air exchanges per hour to be easily converted to a negative pressure OR um, 
by turning on a, a, a separate engineered uh, a, a exhaust fan serving that room and the adjacent areas, um, and um, and that that uh, air that's coming out of that OR is being ducted directly uh, to the outside uh, through uh, stainless steel ductwork with a um, with a bag in bag out uh, HEPA, a HEPA filter. You know, under normal circumstances, that 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 equipment is never even touched. It's only tested monthly when we do our generator test. But uh, you know, it's 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 something that we we're happy that we did and we're, and that we're using quite a bit of today. Great, thank you. Also, also, why we chose it to be in labor and delivery is because if you have a mother that's presenting that you know has a special pathogen. Um, you know, we set it up in a way that that mother could labor, deliver, and recover, um, and even do postpartum in that room, like a full LDRP, um, and we wouldn't have to expose all of our staff. Um, and then they are in an OR if you had to do an emergency C-section. Hey, real, real quick, for, to, to, if I could, if I could just jump on there, the the. Um, yeah. Uh, we, we are getting this, this question a lot. Um, Nebraska Medicine chose to, to, to handle this with equipment um, within the OR and, and the, um, they could speak more to the procedural side of that. Um, but, but this has been all over the national uh, ASHI message boards. And, and one, one thing that you need to take in, in, into account if, if you're going to do that is you know, the, the most appropriate way is to create a vestibule outside or, or if you have enough room, which most don't, um, immediately inside. Um, so you can keep that operating room positive with respect to um, everything else. And then, and, then, and then that vestibule itself can collect the air and, and, and get rid of it. So it's, it's what, what's referred to in the code as a combo room, but, but that's, that's, the, um, that's the most immediate uh, and safest, safest way to do that. Yeah, that's exactly how we did it. So, okay. you know, the, the, we, we designed it in such a way that you would walk into, you know, a, a neutral area which was negative to the corridor, to the OR suite, uh, where you could then don your PPE, um, do your scrubbing, and then uh, go into the OR, and the OR was more positive to the, uh, to the ante room than to the corridor. Yep. Great, thank you both. Uh, do either of our, our sites have a checklist that we might share for how to, like what are all the steps involved to convert, you know, t these rooms to negative pressure rooms? Because I'm sure there's a methodology process that you all use. Is that something we could put into a checklist? Yeah, absolutely. I'd be, I'd be more than happy to share. Um, the, the, from that, you could get the, the basic principle of it. They are very, very um, detailed in, in the specific areas that you're converting because of system type. So, I mean, they get down into the weeds on decoupling safeties and um, what you're doing with free stats and how you're handling fire alarms and all of those things that are, that are, that are inherently in the control system to tell a, a, a system not to do what we're telling it to do. Um, but but from, from a standpoint of, did you check this? Did you check this? Did you check this? They would be very helpful and we'll provide those. Great. Thank you. Any other final comments by any of our uh, speakers today? I don't think we have any here. Okay. Well, great. I uh, just wanted to again remind you all that we will be putting the audio and slide deck up on needtech.org very soon for your ability to download and share accordingly. And then again, um, during this uh, challenging time, just let us know how we can help. And if you have questions, just email us at info at Thanks for attending today and have a great rest of the day.